Hi everybody, this is the lecture to accompany Chapter 7 in your textbook. Please carefully read Chapter 7 as there are a lot of things in it that I don't have time to address in this lecture. Okay, let's talk about listening. Listening is an incredibly important part of the communication process. I've collected a couple of quotes here that really point that out. The ancient philosopher Zeno said that we have two ears and one mouth, so we should listen more than we talk. Bernard Baruch said, Most of the successful people I've known are the ones who do more listening than talking. According to William Hazlitt, the art of conversation is the art of hearing as well as of being heard. And President Calvin Coolidge said, It takes a great man, and of course woman, to be a good listener. What do I mean when I use the term listening? Well, listening is the active process, active being the important word there, of making meaning out of another person's spoken message. It's not something that just happens. It is active, and it requires more than just hearing. We'll go over that in just a second. But listening effectively is incredibly important. We do it for a great deal of time throughout our day. And certainly, as a college student, you're in class a lot. You're doing a lot more listening than you are talking. But of course, good listening skills are very essential, not just in college, but in your future career, with your families, and your friends. Let's go into a little more depth about those misconceptions about listening. The first myth is that hearing is the same as listening, but that's not the case. They are connected, obviously. Hearing, though, is the physical and physiological part. Listening is the part that takes place later in your brain after you've collected all that data. Another myth is that listening is natural and effortless, that you don't have to do anything, that it just happens. That is not true at all. Now, for hearing, as long as you don't have some kind of disability that interferes with that natural process, you don't have to put forth any effort and you can hear. However, listening is the part where the effort comes into play, and it certainly is mental effort, if nothing else. And the final myth is that all listeners hear the same message, but that's not true at all. Two people might hear the same exact message, but because they perceive it differently, remember we talked about perception, that no two people perceive exactly the same thing. So they might hear the same thing, but the message that they interpret after getting that information could be entirely different. There is something called the Hurrier Model of Effective Listening, and that's an acronym for these six steps, hearing, understanding, remembering, interpreting, evaluating, and responding. So let's look at each of these in turn. Hearing, obviously, I just talked about that. That is the physical perception of sound waves as they enter your ear, and then the nerve impulses take that information up into your brain. The second step is understanding. You basically have to understand what is being said. What could get in the way of that? Well, maybe somebody's speaking a different language. They might be speaking the same language, but they're using some slang or jargon that you don't understand. And that will also get in the way of the understanding process. The third step is what's called remembering. Now, remembering has to do with all the other information that you have stored in your memory that you can pull out when needed so that you can say, yes, I understand what this particular word or piece of information means. The fourth step is interpreting, and that is where your brain takes on all this data and tries to make sense out of it. So it tries to figure out the meaning of the words and the nonverbal information that is going along with those words. 
The fifth step is evaluating, and we do listen a lot of times to evaluate whether or not the message that we're getting is is true, is accurate, is opinion versus fact, that kind of thing comes into play at this step. And then finally, the last part of the listening process is where we give feedback, we respond. So all those things are very, very important. Now, because they happen so fast, we may kind of go back and forth between those steps before we get to the responding part. We also have different, uh, the book calls them ways of listening, but I like to think of them as different levels of listening. Informational listening has to do with trying to gather information in order to gain knowledge. As it says here, we engage in informational listening when we're taking notes in class or watching the television news or listening on the radio or we're paying attention to our GPS system when it's telling us where to go. It basically is a fairly passive process. We are taking in more than we're feeding back or responding. But it is a very critical part of listening because if we don't listen in this way, we're not going to learn anything. A different level of listening is called critical listening. And critical listening is very important. It means listening to evaluate or to analyze something. Now, when do we do this? Well, we do this quite a bit. We engage in critical listening when we pay attention to a commercial. We engage in critical listening when we are listening to a debate between two candidates. And so we have to make those evaluations as we're listening. Critical listening doesn't mean criticizing necessarily. So don't think that listening critically means you're trying to pick it apart, but it does mean that you are trying to evaluate it to make sure that it is true, factual, makes sense, and is something that you can believe. And finally, The last level of listening is called empathic listening. And empathic listening is particularly important in our families and with our social relationships and with our friends at work, certainly. Empathic listening means trying to understand what the speaker is thinking or feeling. So what we're doing when we're listening empathically is trying to put ourselves into another person's situation, trying to see it from a different perspective. Sometimes when someone is talking to you about a problem they're having in their life, the best thing you can do is to just simply try to imagine what you would do or how you would respond if you were in that situation and that's what's called empathy so empathic concern is that ability that we have to identify how people are feeling to experience those feelings ourselves and to be able to relate to and connect to that person and if they want maybe even give them some feedback about what they might be able to do there are a lot of things that get in the way of our ability to listen effectively Noise is a barrier to effective listening. Now, if you recall, in chapter one, when we talked about the different types of communication models, one of the things that is always there is noise. And noise is any kind of physical, physiological, or even psychological barrier that distracts us from listening to what we ought to be or want to listen to. Another barrier is pseudo-listening and selective attention. Pseudo-listening means that you're pretending to pay attention to someone. You may even be acting like you're paying attention to them with eye contact and nodding and all those kinds of things, and yet you're actually thinking of something else. I know that you've done that. We've all done that. But stop to think about how the other person must feel. I mean, think about it. How do you feel when you realize that someone is not paying any attention to you when you think that what you're saying is important? It doesn't feel very good, does it? Yes, maybe you should start looking at it from other people's points of view and really try to pay attention when they're talking to you. Now, selective attention is kind of pseudo-listening. Basically, you're only listening to what you want to hear. So you might be paying attention to that person, but you drift off because you think, oh, this isn't important to me. And then when they say something that triggers your brain, where it says, 
oh, I should probably listen now. Then you come back into the to conversation and listen to them, but otherwise you're not really paying much attention at all. We are exposed to thousands of messages on a daily basis, and we can get overwhelmed with this kind of information. For example, we're exposed to at least 600 advertisements each day, and it can be difficult to pay attention to certain messages when we have so many to process. We have to take that into consideration as well. There's something called glazing over, and it happens when our brains are processing information so quickly, but people are speaking more slowly, and so our minds kind of have a lot of time to wander in between the messages we're getting. Unfortunately, it can cause us to wander when we should be listening. It can cause us to miss important details about what's going on. Then there's something called the rebuttal tendency. This is a big barrier to effective listening. It usually happens when we're in the critical listening mode. We're listening to this person and we hear something with which we disagree. And instead of continuing to listen, we stop listening to them and start to mentally argue with that person. So we miss important details about what they're saying. If we waited to process that information until they were done making their point, then we might have had our rebuttal actually answered by what that person is saying. But it does tend to get us to shut off our listening because we're too busy coming up with an argument. Close-mindedness goes past rebuttal tendency. Basically, once you hear something with which you disagree, you simply stop listening and refuse to listen to anything more on that subject. Now, there are a lot of people that are closed-minded, but only about certain things, not about everything. But closed-mindedness certainly can get in the way of giving you information that you might actually need if you chose to listen to it. Then there's such a thing as competitive interrupting. And competitive interrupting means using interruptions to take control or dominate a conversation. Now, interrupting is fairly common in regular conversation, and generally it's not competitive. You can tell if it is if somebody bursts into your conversation, won't let you finish, talks over you. Those kinds of things are what the book means by competitive interrupting. And as I said, it, it stops the communication process because the person who interrupts at that point is no longer listening to what you have to say. So certainly we can become better listeners. There are a couple of different things that you can do in order to be a better informational listener. A key strategy is to separate what is and isn't said. So what I mean by that is that we have a tendency to hear words or statements that weren't actually said. The book uses an excellent example about a television commercial for a pain reliever. They say nothing is more effective than their product. The advertisers are hoping that you think that their particular pain reliever is the strongest one available. But all they said is that nothing is more effective. That doesn't mean that there aren't products that are just as effective. Those are called weasel words, basically. And what that means is they're kind of sneaking information in and it appears like they mean something when they really aren't saying that. Do your best to avoid what's called the confirmation bias. And that's the tendency to pay attention only to information that supports your values and beliefs while you either discount or completely ignore information that doesn't support your beliefs. And it can get in the way of listening because we pay more attention to things that we already agree with. Good informational listeners are aware that their beliefs are not necessarily accurate. Remember, there's truth, <laughs> and then there's truth with a capital T, and perception is not truth. So when you listen, try to listen beyond the things that you already agree with. Then listen for substance more than style. Focus on accuracy of 
information rather than maybe the way the information is said. We have a tendency to pay more attention to things that are dramatic or shocking. And if we listen to somebody talk, we might get distracted by how attractive they are rather than what they're saying or how not attractive they are. And then we ignore what they're saying. So you really have to pay attention to the information. Look past what is dramatic and vivid and what you believe in necessarily and focus on the substance of what you're hearing. A lot of our communication requires us to listen critically. So there are a couple of ways to get better at that. And the first one is to be a skeptic. The word skeptic has a bad reputation. Don't confuse it with cynicism or just finding fault with everything. That's not what it is. Skepticism is evaluating evidence for a claim. Somebody makes a claim and you say, what evidence do you have so that I can believe that this claim that you're making is true? So then you listen and evaluate that evidence when people make claims. That's really all being a skeptic is. If you just buy into what someone says without hearing the evidence for that, that's not very good critical listening. Evaluating a speaker's credibility. Besides analyzing the merits of the argument, good critical listeners also paying attention to the speaker's credibility. Now, what's credibility? That's how reliable and trustworthy you believe that someone is. All things being equal, I would believe a national television network over the National Enquirer. Why? Because the National Television Network has a reputation for attempting to give good information, and the National Enquirer doesn't. And finally, understanding probability. Now you probably wonder what probability has to do with being a good listener, but part of evaluating a claim means speculating about the likelihood that that claim might actually be true. People confuse the terms possible and probable. If something is certain, means that it is 100% true. There's a lot of gray area where something might be possible or probable. So possible means that it has less than 50% chance of being the case. Probable is between 50 and 99% certain being the case. When you're taking information into account, you have to look at the probability of that statement being true. And if you understand those things, that'll give you a better grasp and a handle on the information. And you can come to a much better conclusion based on that information. You can also become a better empathic listener. Listening non-judgmentally. Again, if somebody's talking to us about something that is important to them, and maybe it's about something with which we disagree, but it's important to them and they want you to listen to them, you may just need to put your feelings aside and fight the urge to jump into the conversation and put your two cents in because maybe more than anything else, they just need to be heard. Acknowledge feelings. Part of empathizing is putting yourself in that person's place and trying to understand how somebody else feels. One of the ways in which we can let that person know that we are connecting with them on that emotional level is to do what are called continuous statements like, I see, or wow, that must have been horrible, or what did you do then? Instead of shutting them down with terminator statements where you say, yeah, well, I don't agree with that at all. <laughs> Once you say something like that, you really kind of have shut that person off. It's not what you want to do when you are trying to listen empathically. And then, of course, you can always communicate your support non-verbally while they're talking. You give them eye contact. If it's appropriate, you might want to, you know, put your hand on their shoulder or something of that nature just to let them know. Nod. Do something that you think is appropriate in the situation and with that particular person to let them know that you are being supportive of them. This is the end of the lecture to accompany chapter seven.